can all sorted. Um, number three is the declarations of interest. Any declarations this morning? Thank you. Number four, public forum petitions and deputations. We haven't been made aware of any of those. Okay. Uh, number five is the confirmation of minutes from 16th of November. We'll have a chance to look at those. So, um, any, I'd like to move that we thank you, Journey, seconded. Thank you, second, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Chairman Horrell. Uh, any changes or additions to those minutes before I put them? Thank you. In that case, um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Next. Carried. Thank you. Uh, we have no extraordinary or urgent business, and I've not received any questions. Number eight, um, item eight is the Chairman and Councillor's reports. Do we have any verbal reports? Excellent. I look forward to hearing some next time when you're all. Just a brief one. A number of us did attend the uh, local government uh, meeting in, in Lumsden the other day, which was quite well attended, but by a, a considerable number of Voices for Freedom who these voices were quite loud, but overall, I thought, I thought, I thought it was a good meeting. Um, I met with the chair on a number of occasions, and certainly we're making the point that we, we certainly wanted the ability to uh, have South and solutions to the issues. So it was good that they came down, and um, there was quite a few from local government there as well. So. I thought it was one of the better meetings I've been to. Some of us have had presentations at the zones in the past, but they don't seem to have made up their mind on promising us the next report will have some, some quite um, firm direction. And uh, so we'll watch that with interest. Uh, when, when are they expecting the release of that next? I think it's June. Sometime oh. it's a date in June when that report um, will go back to government. Where, where it goes from there is anybody's guess at the moment, but we'll watch with interest. Thanks for that, Chairman. Um, it took quite a lot of effort to get the uh, those people into the region, even um, let alone into the actual region of the region. Um, so, so congratulations to those people who lobbied um, to get their group uh, into our area, and um, I hope they appreciated. Even just the logistics of um, perhaps living rurally uh, that some of them may or may not be familiar with. So I think there were lots of bonuses um, in our being able to attend a meeting in Lumsden. Thanks for hosting us, Lumsden. Thanks, Chairman. Any other verbal reports? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, moving swiftly on. Uh, item 9.1. Um, is the start of the General Manager Strategy, Science and Engagement and General Manager Policy and Government Reforms Report. Goodness me, item one is <laughs> we need to work on that. <laughs> the Local Government Reform, uh, reform Submission. Um, just um, making it clear that we are approving the key points for inclusion in the report and we're delegating authority to the Council's Chief Executive to finalise the submission which has to be lodged by the 28th of February. Um, Lucy. Thanks, yeah. So um, just quickly taking you um, to the report, it's quite succinct. The draft submission points obviously came from the workshop that we held with yourselves. And um, as Councillor Lovo said, the um, contemplation closes on the 28th of February. So if there were any additional comments or points that Council wanted us to include, um, that this is the moment for those. Um, if you are, would like any questions to be answered in terms of how we framed up the, the draft submission at the moment, happy to answer those as well, but I'll take it as read and it obviously came from the workshop discussions that we had the other day. So. Yeah. I, sure. just, um, it's, I just made mention of before, I was just wondering if there's an opportunity that um, we were talking about um, upholding the Treaty of White and its principles. Um, that there might be able to be reference to in those treaty settlements that have been settled. Um, because well, there's a whole lot of blood and blood going on out there, and people think, still think that there's a fight going on, but 
we've got one where we actually settled their differences with the crowd mm -hmm. and um, the, the dispute going on. We've passed the grievance mode and, and, and uh, uh, we sent it. It didn't pull back into as if we were in storm grievance mode and gone past that in development mode. Now, and um, I don't think there's a lot of people out there seem to understand that. So I don't know if it can be some sort of reference to treaty settlements, might be uh, to help people to understand that there has been settlements. Uh, settlements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Chairman Horrell and then Chairman Morris. Ah, Councillor Morrison. Um, I see we are sort of giving some support to um, lowering the voting age. After the discussion the other day, uh, I'm certainly not in favour of it. We've had a, had a judgment saying it, it's sort of um, penalising 16 year olds. I don't think a high court decision may be the same because otherwise you can go to 14 year olds. What I do like, and this, this is um, the possibility, and we've done it to a certain extent with our regional forum. The concept of um, participatory democracy, where you actually have a wider group that um, actually has a role with the elected officials. And I think the regional forum was a really good example of where we, we endeavoured to get um, a regional and demographic spread. I, I think going forward, if we want people to be more involved, that would be a, good, a great way of getting some of those groups who are not necessarily represented now. So, I, so personally, I, I'm I'm not not in favour of lowering the uh, the voting age for a whole lot of reasons. Um, the uh, the 18 year old argument was about you could fight for your country, you could um, do, go to the hotels, all that sort of things, which I'm not sure a lot of parents would want for their 16 year, year olds. And, and the worry of that that one decision was that then a couple of years time, if you went that way, well, what what 14 year olds are now being discriminated against? You might end up having a crash because people are that mm. young. <laughs> so, uh, apart from that, I, I, I think it's quite good. But I actually quite like that idea of having creating a group that aren't your elected um, um, members that people will do for the democratic process, but trying to broaden participation, which obviously youth councils and, and things like that would be an ideal uh, um, addition to the to those broader people who may be able to feed into into councils. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morrison. Um, yeah, a couple of comments, and perhaps my perception is a little bit different in the chairs on that voting issue. Based on what I saw happening in Riversdale last Friday, my response would be the sooner we lower the voting age, the better, because wisdom uh, and years on the planet don't necessarily align from what I saw happening uh, on Friday. And perhaps it speaks to that issue. If you are employed and paying taxes, maybe there's a sense that of no taxation without representation. That could be one way of thinking about it, to coin a phrase from some time ago. Um, in respect of well being and the need for definition, one idea that did emerge for me was that if we're seeking to empower local government to a greater degree through these reforms, um, possibly. An absence of definition leaves space for a local definition to emerge, for local communities and regions to define well-being on their terms and in their context. So it may be worth just questioning if that's the intent. Um, that would be maybe value in that. Uh, and finally, the third point on um, the aging population issue. Um, I think it may be worth also noting within what is included there that included with that is projection of decreasing workforce age population. But I think that is possibly the more critical thing is that New Zealand's approaching a situation we've not been confronted with before with a decreasing workforce age population, especially in the 20 to 40 year bracket over the next 20 years. And I know that those who have employment, you know. Are really playing a, a juggling act to, to support council activity as well as being in the workplace. That is only going to get far more pressing um, forward. So I'm just wondering if it's just emphasizing that reducing workforce age thing might be helpful. Uh, and I suspect that Southland may not be a winner in terms of attracting useful people um, over the next 20 years, giving them back to the university, bases, that kind of stuff.
Thanks, Councillor. Um, Councillor MacDonald. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I sort of support those discussions. What really get uh, highlighted for me was the last local body elections where everyone spouted localism. They wanted more decisions made locally, but then the participation rates through these elections have just been going down over the years. So I understand people were trying everything they can to get that engagement up. So this is where that's come from. The other frustrating thing for me is that why do we continually wait for government to come up with solutions for us when the solutions are here in Southland? And it's I said it before, it's how are we going to organize ourselves to better better um, for the people of the province? So um, I'm not going to be looking at central government and waiting for them to do things. We need to start talking ourselves. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Robbie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, there's a number of weight issues here and um, some of them are very difficult to resolve, as Phil was suggested. Um, but I'm with him. I think that uh, giving votes to the 16-year-olds, especially the local government, it's, wouldn't cause any harm. Um, there are older people that don't bother to vote, so, um, and, and they're uh, allowed to. So the situation would probably be the same if you lowered the age, a voting age by a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure how we resolve that here around this table, but um, there's obviously some different opinions. Um, but I do agree with Nicole about trying to encourage or having mechanisms to encourage um, other people who are not on the council to be involved in local government. And I think we probably all agree with that. And the regional forum was a good example, but mm -hmm. um, we need to be looking for other opportunities in, in that area. And I know. Councils do this, and the youth councils do that sort of thing, but it should be something that we really focus on and try and promote a bit more. You know, we haven't we haven't got a youth council here, for example, although the city and the San the City Council um, has. So having um, having those opportunities for other people to participate in local government without necessarily being elected and having to be on the council for full time, but having a meaningful input. Um, is really important. So fostering those mechanisms, I think, would be good and something we could emphasise. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gotton. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, we're a bunch of oldies discussing what, what young people can or can't do. And I think it is quite interesting. It's a political issue and it's a progressive conservative issue and uh, sides are fairly well, well divided. I'm just not quite sure uh, Chairman Holt's comment about his discomfort with it. Did you make a change as a result of of that in terms of this? Because we're still, I guess, we're still discussing that. Yeah. And I think that um, um, Chloe Zabrick's uh, experience in Auckland, where a younger person took on the issue of gathering up support from younger people, very successfully. So that's why I'm a little bit. What's the word? Um, jade, not jaded, but listening to us talk about this, it just seems. Not quite right, and there's definitely a need for um, greater youth involvement in our council. We all know that, and um, we're probably not the right people to be um, strategizing about how that might happen. But I expect that a lot of good things could happen if we were a bit courageous about it. Thank you. Um, yes, go. Um, and then just I'll just do the chair. I was just um, in direct response to um, Councillor Guyton's comment there. What I could suggest um, if the uh, councillors were happy to support would be um, that last sentence um, at paragraph 13, which is could be helpful in this regard, is to soften that slightly to maybe helpful and um, to ensure that we add those additional points about the other routes we think that the government should be looking right. at in terms of encouraging more support around those non-elected um, and a broadening role for um, other people who aren't particularly well um, represented and linking that to um, Councillor McDonald's point about thinking about innovation at a local level so kind of getting out of the way of some of those local solutions for local people so I think I can catch the tenor of the conversation and, and adjust that paragraph in that regard if, if that would um, great I mean you can perhaps add in my two cents and Councillor McPhail's in just a minute <laughs> um, the um, the voting age, I think, 
um, and because I work with people in that age group, um, 16 would be fine if we coupled it with some civics education uh, because there's a, there's a couple of generations of, of people who don't, don't understand, don't have no contact with um, local government or central government actually until they get into trouble sometimes. Um, so I think uh, coupling that, lowering that age um, with, with some civics education, compulsory civics education in at least the secondary schools um, would, would be my preference uh, so that they're fully informed when they're making their decisions, as we all should be. Um, the other thing I have uh, a little concern with is the use of the word boomers. Um, <laughs> I'm not one because I miss out by like two years. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether um, I'm comfortable with having that in the document. Um, perhaps. Yes, I know, but um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable, but that's just a minor issue. Um, and I've um, remuneration around some of these things. If we're, if we're to um, encourage more community involvement in whatever form, uh, it will be critical for some funding to support that work, uh, maybe for the others that we are involving and also for us to manage that within our operational budgets. Uh, that is me. Oh, and just the other thing is actually it's not just young people that are missing around this table. <laughs> Um, there are there are a number of demographics that are not covered. So um, we're not just talking about in, um, engaging with young people. We're um, there's a whole lot of other demographics that could have a voice. So that is my two cents. Uh, I've got Councillor McPhail and then back to Chairman Horrell quickly. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm trying to work out how not to offend certain people society, but. Um, I think I, I, I support uh, Chairman Horrell's. The reality is, I think we need to live life with it before you actually um, get the maturity and voting. And I'm not, not saying just cut off a whole youth part of our society, but um, knowing living with teenagers at the moment and things like that, I, I think uh, some days they have you know, problems just even knowing where their bedroom is, let alone. They, uh, uh, working out how to vote, who to vote for. Um, I, I would say I, we've seen even around this council table where youth has been involved in elections um, and putting a person maybe on here that's a bit younger and then was dead silence for three years. I don't I don't think, uh, so there is a maturity on this, and I mean, this is what Robert said, you know, the youth get together and they'll put something in here. You actually you need to... I think you need to experience life with it before uh, uh, you probably get to say how life goes. You know, I'm just being honest. I'm not saying uh, not off the table, but um, yeah, I'll just make that point. Uh, and, um, and another thing, I see the World Economic Forum, I mean, it's been mentioned here, and there's probably not a lot known in regards people might not understand what the World Economic Forum is. Has that come up in the, is that part of it, is that uh, asking a question, is that a report, the influence of the year? Because there is a wee bit of, uh, probably be very clear just what who they are and what they do, and not government as such, so. Are you wanting to answer that question? No, no, I'm just on the list. I just want to put that quick and maybe could uh, have a quick briefing on who they are. Here you go. Happy to um, provide a briefing on the World Economic Forum. The, the report that's highlighted there is just kind of well-timed in terms of the current challenges and connecting it to um, the points that are made by local government in terms of the challenges that are going to be before us. The local government reform report is intended to be future-proofing what local government looks like, so staff felt that that would be an interesting insight report to draw uh, council attention to as well as make reference to. Um, if it's if you'd prefer to have a briefing in advance of it being included as part of the submission, totally happy to do that. Just, then it does get a bit of notes from conspiracy theorists and 
uh, in regards to them. It's tied into a lot of manipulation of worlds, uh, governments, and things. So, uh, if we can get some clarity on. Uh, Just to clarify, Councillor, would you like that before the submission oh, no, is. No, 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 I think it was mentioned. I just said for us is to have people then need to understand who they are. I'm not, I'm not against them. I'm yeah. Just but would you like the briefing before the submission is lodged or not? Oh, I don't think it changed, but it's just on the subsidy. I was just wondering mm -hmm. how it got in there and things like that. Perhaps upon um, us to make sure we read it. Thank you. Uh, I've got Chairman Horrell and then Councillor Gibson and Councillor Roy, and then we'll tidy up the conversation. Thank you. I think one of the key things that's missing from this report is how we make local government relevant to all people. And, and that's been the conundrum we've been dealing with for quite some time. And, and changing the, the voting age and changing the system is not going to actually deal with that. People feeling that they can influence decisions locally, I think, it is important. And we, that has been discussed in some of those forums. But, but really, that, that is the key thing. That, most people actually vote for a national, national election. So, so what's missing? Uh, and, and I believe it is that people are either too busy or they don't see it's relevant. And so, so somehow we need to be able to, I think everybody agrees that there's a hole in the street. You need to be able to ring somebody and get, get it fixed. So, so somehow on this reform, whatever changes, it, it has to be relevant to all people. So that you know, democracy is quite a, quite an it's a privilege and a right. And at the moment, we don't take we don't tend to respect it that much. You look at Ukraine uh, and democracy for uh, 28 years, they're prepared to die for it. We've got a wee bit complacent here, I think. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gibson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, Chair, Chair Madam, Madam Chair. Um, the, the, to improve our image, I think, is, is to really get the communication out there as to what does go on in here. Um, so as it becomes known, what sort of decisions are made and what sort of influence you can have on the community. Um, and I think we're very poor at that uh, at present. The other thing is looking at the voting age at 16. Um, I had got tangled up in a discussion in Nelson on this one, and um, my opposition were telling me that oh, we can just put it in as another um, subject in, in the school curriculum. I said, well, the school curriculum is failing us everywhere now. So we're, we're in the lower end of the um, of all of the um, measures. Um, so I think that um, the point is that uh, we can't do that sort of thing. So really, uh, we've got to have life's experiences of hard knocks before we can uh, make reasonable sort of decisions, I think. And that would be my comment to it, Madam Chair. Yes, Councillor um, Roy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, um, I think the biggest question is participation in voting across the centre when we have less than 50% of people who actually pay rates uh, vote. And, and that's more significant to me than, than youth participation, who actually would be very, very few 16 year olds who pay rates. So the argument about Paying taxes and representation, I, I don't think it's relevant or pertinent in this particular case. I do acknowledge that we need to be better engaged across all sectors, and youth is one of those. And just giving them the vote, I don't think I, well, no, I wouldn't be supportive. I think that I've got 13 grandchildren and they know what I do, and just knowing what their level of understanding of regional councils, and, uh, yeah, I, I just, would have a reluctance to think we will solve the problem of youth participation or youth interest by handing out votes. I'm not persuaded. Thank you. Thank you, and finally, Councillor Guyton. So just very quickly, yeah. um, this idea of um, empowering locals to make local decisions is a fine one, but looking at what's happening in the North Island at the moment, I think that people who've been flooded out of their homes are not looking to the local community to help them, they're looking to central government. And with climate change doing that kind of thing more and more often, we are going to find that we need to rely on a centralised system. All of us do, far more so than we think we do at the moment. Thank you, interesting. Um, I have one more comment, actually, and that is paragraph nine, um, the list of risks and immediate manifestations. Um, I would suggest that we should add climate change into that list. 
groups. Um, okay, so we've had quite a wide range of discussion and we've gone down a wee bit of a rabbit hole of voting age. Um, Lucy, can I just get you to reiterate what you think you'll put in mm -hmm. and then we'll close the discussion off. Thank you. Well, I think um, what we will attempt to do with that particular part there is, um, as I said, kind of change the wording slightly so that it's reflecting the range of discussions. But I would like to bolster it with some of the suggestions that we've made today. And so an element of Sir Chairman Hoyle's point around how we make local government relevant um, and encouraging support of that in various ways, um, identifying the fact that um, we need to promote ourselves more, but also to look to innovation for new ways of engaging with our demographics of all kinds. Um, the other thing, so that's where I sort of tone that Set that one. Um, to Stuart's point, nobody um, had a counter. I think we definitely include the point about just making reference to the treaty settlements and um, also the work on the um, leaving the door open for a definition of well being at a local level. So I thought that one as well. So those were the three big changes, but our, yeah, that um, paragraph 13 probably will need to be. Slightly to reflect the discussions. So, given that that's quite a little bit of a change, um, will you circulate the submission at <coughs> the end? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. fine. And um, what I would suggest is that that final sentence, at uh, paragraph 13, a change to that and then a, moder a moderation of it. So, lowering the voting age may be helpful in this regard. However, and then we can bolster it slightly with some of the. Right. So, councillors can expect a updated version to come to them um, well before the 28th, I would suggest. <laughs> I'm looking at Shana and Nick at the back of the room who are going to be doing the drafting, and I would think by the end of the week it's not a long submission, so Shana's been listening into the conversations. So. That can read a recommendation, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Morrill. Seconded, please. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. All those in favour, please say aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. I think that perhaps highlights that discussion um, that we we need to perhaps workshop our um, some of that broader um, democracy and local government conversation still. I'm um, looking at Nick up the back, um, just so that we can um, continue to explore some options and as Peter's uh, Councillor McDonald suggested, um, write our own script. Anyway, <laughs> next item on the agenda is the resource management in three water submission. Welcome, Rachel. <coughs> Morning, Kai Tanu. So uh, through you, Chair, we obviously have a number of pieces of legislation going through at present relating to reform. And you will call we had a uh, well, Pulling on from last year's conversations, quite a significant workshop on the 25th of January. The process with the resource management legislation was that we workshopped it. Key submission points went to the council meeting on the 1st of February for you to confirm, and then the final submission um, was put together and submitted at that point. So, for your information, you have a copy of the final submission on the special planning bill and the global environment bill. We also workshops the Water Services Legislation Bill, which was part of the three rules reform. And you indicated an interest in putting a high level submission and on that particular piece of legislation as well. And we've continued to liaise with the Otago Southland Councils uh, that are all considering their submissions um, at present. You might recall that Dunedin City Council was doing quite a detailed legal analysis. So in the item, um, the key concerns from that legal analysis are highlighted and that have been discussed amongst the councils. Um, in the, the submission points, uh, we tried to reflect your conversation about in supporting the intent of the bill, um, the alignment with Tamano to Y, and just, I guess, noting that other councils are identifying implementation issues. So those points for submission are contained so we might just put a check that you're happy with those and consider whether there's anything left out. Uh, so we've got two pieces there. Um, the three waters and the um, 
and sorry, Brian's gone deep, and the resource management um, submission. So any comments on the first one? Thank you. We'll go three words to last. Any comments on that submission? Must have been a real challenge getting all of those diverse opinions and thoughts together. So well done. Uh, Chino Horrell? Well, I guess what, one, one of the concerns for me is once again, you've got an entity being set up who want to be exempt from paying rates. And um, in other words, your local rate payers are subsidising another government institution. We, we all hope that through the, the last item that the funding of these things will be dealt with in some ways, but have another large entity set up and saying, by the way, we're from the government and you can subsidise us on. Totally opposed to that there are. A number of aspects in that um, legislation that are probably got, that do raise concerns, I guess, for um, the local government and where things are going to lie. It's certainly a huge um, increase in the penalties for non-compliance, and it's not clear at the moment as to who's going to be enforcing that. Is it, is it regional areas, councils? Um, will that be the, the environmental protection agency? There's, there's a lot of stuff in this. this both these little bits of legislation that are not probably as clear as they could be at the moment. And probably got a couple of comments on the other issue, but we'll do a deal with the first one first. Um, any other thoughts on the special planning? Uh, Thanks, Councillor Rodway. Uh, right, so just to make it clear, so you were talking about the three waters. Uh, yes, yeah, not the MBA. Okay, so uh, we're now moving on from the MBA. No, I had intended to start with the MBA, but whatever suits you. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a few, there's a few things. Um, there's comments here <coughs> on page, um, page 21. So on that page, summary of that concerns community participation of the democratic decision making process. Was severely eroded by the new system. <clears throat> I would suggest that that has already happened. That we only need to look at the environmental decisions on the water plan for uh, that to show that that's which is all because it was uh, had your input into the water plan and now the environment court process is really taken away, in my interpretation anyway, a lot of that. That decision making and, and it comes down to the evidence of the submitters who have got uh, resources to be able to participate in that process and the interpretation of the judge to make that decision. <coughs> While that might be true that the, the democratic decision making process is severely eroded in the new system, it's already occurring. I don't know whether. <coughs> um, yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, I failed in my duties to remind you that this submission has already been lodged. Yeah. Um, so, so if you had um, oh, some, some comments, absolutely make the comment. But um, it's already yeah. it's already been finalised. Lodged, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, um, you know, I guess that was. Is the main thing. Um, the other thing is about local decision making. Something to keep in mind that maybe for the future is that the reason we need this new system is that a lot of local decisions that we've made in the past 20 years um, really have led to a deterioration in, in our environment. And we haven't had enough, we say, guidance, if you like, or direction from. Um, yeah, from the national government to make sure that we do things consistently and that we do protect the plan. So, in some ways, the NBA is an attempt to do that. So, I don't see this top down control being such a bad thing as other people do. I guess that's the, certainly risks with it. But, you know, the current system needs to be fixed. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Pimpton. Sorry, probably just disagree with that last comment around the top down because we go back 20 years and we're talking about the dairy expansion. Um, central government was requesting it a full percent growth year on year out uh, through that period, so they certainly contributed to the expansion down here. So I 
Yes, it's a complex, complex and ugly issue. Uh, Chairman Horrell. Sure. Yes, Madam Chair, and I know the staff have done a good job in, in putting together this, this submission, but hopefully we will see some, some changes. In a more <laughs> yes, we, we do want to see more national consistency, but we do want regional flavour. So there's some questions in, in that particular issue. The, uh, the, the other one I think we do need to watch reasonably closely is, is a lot of the RMA was very good, and it's not clear that that environmental um, balance is going to come through in these various bills. So that's something we've got to, to watch going forward. We certainly do want to get rid of the litigious um, part we go through now. We have got lawyers and consultants who we were our own plan seven years and it's still not settled. That that has to, it's got to be fixed. It's got to be clear. It's got it's got to be fair to all participants and not the old system where people can wait and go to the environment or because we've got deep pockets. We all want the right and we, we all want the right um, outcomes at the end of the day. So we'll we'll watch with interest where this lands once it goes through the select committee. But uh, it would be good because it's so important that we get a degree of bipartisanship. At the end of it, because um, if, if it isn't, I'm not quite sure it'll, it'll land. Being done at haste, and it's always a little bit of a worry, but we, we all know it's been broken and it needs to be fixed. Thank you. I might just get Lucy to um, talk us through some of the what happens next. That's um, I think that might help. Thank you, so, um, in terms of the comments around what further work needs to happen and those and clarifying points in Council Woodway. The, um, the bills are still draft. They're not um, finalised. They're still, they've obviously taken submissions and are likely to do some more changes. Um, through the various groups that I'm on, we're obviously trying to influence and leverage some ongoing change to both of your points around um, what's already uh, been good and, and the elements that we're already um, struggling with with regards to the Environment Court. Um, so those conversations have been ongoing um, since the submission was made and will continue to. Also wanted to just note that the local government steering group that was established to provide the governance um, oversight and provide advice to the ministry for the formulation of legislation is continuing to operate, but their focus has changed to both implementation and the development of the national planning framework. So that national planning framework part of the puzzle is going to be really, really critical in terms of limits and, um, and targets. So we are in the process of, um, well, we are in active discussions with the ministry in terms of both the scope and the development of that um, secondary piece of legislation, which would be an absolute critical piece to um, both of your points about the environmental management and the ongoing mind. So, yeah. Um, the reliance that we're all placing on the upcoming spatial plans going to be also complex. Um, so can we just uh, cover off page 36, which is the draft submission points on the water services legislation bill. Having had a good frank discussion um, at the workshop, uh, I was quite impressed with how staff have pulled those thoughts together, actually. So. Um, Anybody has a thought on those points? No? Great. Okay. I think the point we're all good. And if this doesn't, if the regulator, it's not impacting us in a big way. But I think the point that we put on that. Yes, it's a, that's a thorny one, but it's very important for us because of the point three. Yes. Right, so the recommendations are three in number. Note the final submission on the spatial planning bill and this natural and built environment bill. Number two, approve key points for inclusion in the submission on the water services legislation bill, which is page 36, and delegate authority to the council's chief executive to finalise the submission based on committee feedback for lodging with the finance and expenditure committee. <coughs> Somebody would like to move those recommendations, please? I'll move the three recommendations, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Seconded, Councillor Morrison, thank you. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Thank you very much. Item three, the 2024 to 34, that sounds terrible, uh, long term plan and the 23 24 annual plan update and timeline. Thanks. 
<laughs> so the long-term plan in particular, um, but also any plan obviously relate to the organisational strategic planning, hence we've got an update on the strategy and policy committee agenda. It's really just showing you the timeline. Uh, we are having a workshop on the annual plan this afternoon. And once that's um, gone through the process, we can focus more on the long-term plan. So we've got just under 18 months now for that process to take place. So that's um, quite an important process in terms of setting the strategic direction of the organisation for the following 10 years and identifying those strategic priorities. And um, you'll note that the timelines uh, that are shown are reasonably high level. We're in the process of bringing together all the different things that are happening at present, for, for example, Pintage to Atahi, uh, the, the climate resilience work and just showing you, I guess, where your core activity will be over the coming months. So that's something that will be coming to you in the near future. But at a high level, you can see the, the plan of attack uh, for the coming year. Thanks, Rachel. Any comments or questions, questions particularly? It's quite a, quite a beast. Um, the only comment I would have was that, that consultation period, we've talked a lot about um, engagement with the community, so um, some, some head scratching and some thinking about how we can creatively do that to reinforce our um, wishes to engage with the community more um, will be really important. Uh, the recommendation is to note the report. Is there, there are no questions? Would somebody like to? Thank you. Councillor Roy seconded. Councillor Rodway, further. All right, all those in favour, please say right. Against, carried. Thanks very much, Rachel. Science update recreational bathing. <laughs> could, make me, could make me chuckle. <laughs> Possibly. Not sure that. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, um, staff, Karen and Ash. Katie. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is um, Katie Black Blackmore. Black Blackmore, sorry. Um, who is our uh, recently started with us in, in December. Um, she's come from Taranaki Regional Council and is our senior service water quality scientist. So she has. Um, Fully immersed herself this summer <laughs> and some recreational yeah, bathing. Yes. <laughs> she had a brief presentation. To Thank you. Give you yes. uh, so, this presentation just covers off the recreational water quality monitoring that the council does in the summer. Um, so, for this monitoring, it fulfills some of our, um, I guess, required work. Um, we do weekly testing from December to March inclusive at a number of sites across freshwater, marine and estuarine sites. And essentially what we're monitoring for is we look at bacteria. So in um, marine sites, we look for enterococci species and freshwater, we look for Escheria coli or E. coli. And essentially, the purpose of this is to ensure that we know about the state of our waterways, whether they're safe for people to use recreationally and we can communicate that to the public. And the other aspect of this is cyanobacteria cover or toxic algae monitoring. And there's also a relatively large aspect of communication. So we have run a promotional campaign over the summer um, and the results are also communicated to the public um, via a number of mechanisms, I guess. So one of those is the Land Air Water RTRO website. Um, territorial authorities are updated on the results because under the guidelines that we work under, they also have some responsibilities. And there are community groups and community facilities that get notified of the results. So, for example, schools where they might go to a beach or any kind of thing. Um, so this slide is just giving you a, um, an image of how the results are communicated on LAWA. 
So this is a website where the results are available in a standard format for the whole country. Um, and just to note that this is the most recent results, so um, reflecting last week's results, and it will be updated when the results come in. Um, and where there are no latest results, it will show a long-term grade of how safe it is to swim in the site. Um, then the council also communicates the results on Beacon, their own website. And this obviously wasn't as updated as um, to show the latest results. But what we also have here is we've got green dots reflecting the E. coli or enterococci levels. And then you can see um, on the slides there are alerts with exclamation marks and the uh, sites where toxic algae warnings are in place. So essentially all of this is done to keep the public safe, try and let people continue to enjoy freshwater environments and we talk about recreational use, so it's important to note that that's not limited to swimming. That is also anything where someone may come into contact with water. So surfing, um, might be kayaking, paddle boarding, where you might not necessarily be immersed in the water, but there is a risk of splashes. And Especially paddle boarding, bike kicking. <laughs> <laughs> Collection of your skill. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, and so this also meets obligations under the RMA and the Public Health Act. So I'll talk now a little bit about enterococci. So this is present in freshwater estuarine, estuarine and marine environments. There are 18 strains, most of which are harmless. Um, and it's an indication of fecal contamination of water from mammals and warm-blooded creatures. It's a part of gut microfauna, but some of the strains can cause health issues. So from a swimming perspective, you're most likely to be affected if you're immunocompromised or already unwell or potentially through open wounds. And We'll move on to E. coli. So E. coli is in freshwater and estuarine environments. It has a lot more strains, over 700. And again, most of them are harmless, but there are a few that can cause um, infection. And similar, it's an indication of fecal contamination of water. It's part of, again, part of the gut microfauna and warm-blooded animals it has the same potential for health. Can I ask a question about that, uh, about the marine heat wave and especially around estuaries, where this has traditionally been a flushing out, but now they're getting a flushing in of heated water. Is that causing issues with these kind of organisms? What I mean is, do they like it warmer? Do they flourish um, in warmer conditions? I guess there is an aspect of they will have thermal preferences. Um, where, where we see issues with warmer water is actually more in relation to algae blooms rather than bacteria. Um, um, can I just clarify whether you want to take questions on the way through or would you rather wait till the end? Uh, perhaps if we wait till the end, if that's okay. Sure. About three more slides. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the important thing for both enterococci and E. coli is that we test these they're not necessarily the things that will make you sick from fecal contamination, but they're what's tested for because there's such a range of pathogens, things that can make people sick, that we can't possibly test for all of them. And the research and the literature shows that these are the best things to test for in terms of linkages with the things that might make you sick. Um, so that's why these are used as um, fecal indicator bacteria. Okay, now if we move on to the sign of bacteria. So this is blue-green algae. You might also hear it called potentially toxic algae. So cyanobacteria is an interesting one. It's a bacteria that has the ability to photosynthesize just like an algae, and it can form blooms. So that might be suspended in fresh water in a lake, 
or as being mats attached to the rocks in a river. Um, and so you might hear these called benthic in a river or planktonic in a lake. So the majority of these are harmless, but some of them have the potential to produce and release toxins. The science isn't really there to understand when the toxic or when the toxins are produced. So we treat it as potentially toxic. We use a precautionary approach and we assume that it is toxic if it's there, although it might not necessarily be at that point in time. And it is something that can vary quite a lot in space and time. Um, so blooms form typically in summer, um, and that's when we get excessive growths. So in particular, it's when you have low flow or particularly stable low flows, warm temperatures, high nutrients, lots of sunlight, and there's impacts both on recreational use, human and animal health, but also there's environmental aspects that can be affected by our peoplings. Um, so now just to summarise, this is the last, um, last few years of freshwater E. coli results. Um, on the slides, you can see a faint yellow line and there's a red line. These are guideline levels for where a warning or when it's not safe to swim. Um, and as you can see, that there's quite a spread in the results. Most of them are at lower levels, but we get, do get high ranked ones as well. So I guess to summarise, we undertake recreational water quality monitoring to fulfil our legislative obligations. This summer, we have had a number of E. coli results above warning thresholds, um, and we've also issued seven toxic algae warnings. I will note with that a couple of them were in November, just prior to the bathing season properly starting. Um, and the other thing to note is that we have had some work done on the potential to forecast conditions when cyanobacteria blooms will occur. Um, at the moment, more research is needed and more data would be needed to inform that to get a better representation of when it might occur. So I guess thank you and um, are there any questions? <laughs> ah, yes, um, I have... Councillor Roy, then Councillor Pemberton, and then Councillor Cook. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two questions. Uh, first one is I'm trying to sort of figure out what might be causal links. So is it is it low flow? Is it temperature? Is it climate change? Is it on land poor performance? Or what do we know about uh, causing causal links? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess for causal links. All of the above apply, um, and particularly for cyanobacteria. For E. coli and bacteria, it is probably less to do with the um, environmental conditions other than flow, but not so much temperature. My second question is you talk about recreational water sports. What about Manga Kai? Do we risk and what do we do about warnings? So, for Mahinga Kai, uh, when there is a toxic algae warning in place, we would recommend that to minimise your consumption of fish and shellfish, less than one meal a week, and any food should be washed well with clean water and um, well gutted and cleaned, essentially, so that you're not consuming the liver and other organs where toxins might accumulate. Um, there is also... The possibility in some cases you could get toxin testing done for shellfish, for example, but that isn't something that we do regularly. Thank you. Um, I guess the question is on the report of the coli is that is purely on what you would consider the microorganisms of the beak on the count. Yes, so, so yeah, so I guess some of that reporting back to the community is. Oh, it's avian. Is there a way of having an avian E. coli and the beaker one side by side so that, because this is while it's used for recreation, people will be analysing to see what their impact on the community or they're personally having on it. And it might, there's an opportunity maybe to get more understanding. So, 
what we're reporting is all E. coli. We're not addressing yeah. the source. Um, that is something that can be done at a cost. Yes. So through, through um, so we have done fecal source drinking in the in the past. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, you need to have quite high levels in order to do fecal source tracking. So it's not something you just through just to part of your standard suite. It's also um, a little bit expensive. So again, that aspect. The other thing to um, bear in mind is it's just a presence absence test. So it can't tell you the relative um, contributions of different sources. I think it's more the conversation around um, we sort of, you know, amen's a problem, not our problem. I think I think that we get some bit of clarity around why we're testing and, and the risk involved and um, we're not trying to pinpoint where it's coming from. We're just trying to identify what form of coli would possibly have a bit more ownership of catchment groups. Like so the, the work that we've done shows that um, uh, of, the, of the samples we tested, the most prevalent uh, in terms of presence absence uh, was ruminant sources by yeah. far and away, which is in almost every sample. Yeah. Um, and, and although there was avian present in some samples, I mean, that, that still poses a public health risk, yeah. just not, not as great a risk. So, um, yes, it's an area we need to you know, continue to do. Yeah. To on. Yes. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Um, we'd all be really delighted if everybody was considering their impact. Um, and the waterways. I hope everybody is. Um, Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the Council's got a really good program of monitoring and reporting, but uh, my concern is, and I'm sure Councillor Evans will have some thoughts about this, is how do we get through to the people who just randomly say it's a hot day, we'll go and jump in the river? Or, or yesterday looks good, you know, let's go and call off. They haven't done their homework, looked at websites. They don't get the newspaper. They've just decided it's hot. They will go for a swim. So how do we get through to them and warn them that they might be at risk? <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Yeah. Um, for you, Madam Chair. So we uh, use as many channels as we have at our disposal. Um, and the results, as Katie said, go out to a wide range of um, agencies and they share them with the as well. Um, there is definitely an element and quite a large one of personal responsibility, which forms a pretty big part of our messaging. People need to know what to look out for, especially when we're talking toxic algae. Um, but we do push alerts out, you know, as, as far and wide as we can. Um, and yeah, I guess that's a um, that's been one that we're looking at more closely for a um, real targeted push in the next. Well, from now onwards, it's around toxic algae and people knowing what to look for. Because, um, like you say, it's hard to get to everyone all the time, but multiple channels trying to be repetitive with the same messages to try and yeah, get people to share that across as well and talk about it. And, and the more you guys talk about it as well, the better. I have no issue with that because I think you do a really good job promoting it that way. But you know, a lot of people don't receive that message. So um, I'm talking about signage on other kinds of warnings at bathing sites. Thanks. It's a it's a signage is a hot topic of conversation. Um, there are some sites that we know have regular blooms of toxic and they do have permanent signage there, but um, they can get damaged and graffitied and people stop taking notice of them depending on you know how many signs there are. There's lots of different access points for people in the community for their swimming hole. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that you'd need to weigh up before you decide to put a sign somewhere. That's not to say we shouldn't. Um, and it's definitely something we've been talking about in the last few weeks because um, yeah, because we're seeing you know a lot of people not knowing what toxic cubby is or what it looks like. Um, even just the social media conversations, we're sort of yeah, tracking some of that, and it's, um, yeah, it, it just highlights there's more work to do there, really. But, yeah, signage is, is one of those aspects that keeps popping up. And, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson, thank you. Follow on from, oh, sorry. Oh, um, follow on from John a little bit. Do you carry on with your monitoring outside the months of December to March? So there is... Um, other monitoring where E. coli is tested for. It's not necessarily at the same sites and it's at a monthly frequency usually rather than weekly. So people probably 
um, have a look at this, and I've got a thing here with about seven things in D, or in red. That's an arm. Uh -huh. Yes. But isn't it the real picture? Because you're taking that through simply for swimming, recreational swimming. Um, you know, and people pick on that, and that'll be what goes in the newspaper. Yes. And that is targeted at conditions when people are most likely to be swimming. When you start to get into year-round monitoring, you get often get more high flows, and you will potentially your year-round results will be a worse picture in a lot of places. Worse picture. Well, because you're capturing a lot more high flows, yes, it can be. They keep diluting it. In high flows, you get a lot more runoff from the land coming into the waterways, and so typically fecal bacteria increases at high flows. So the ducks are going to be a problem all the way through? The ducks and the activities on the land. Thank you. Um, Councillor, uh, well, I've got Councillor McPhail, uh, Councillor McDonald, Councillor Evans, Councillor Rodway, and Chairman Hull. So we have a list. <laughs> uh, please, please um, stick to the broader implications of your questions. Thank you. <coughs> um, in regards to the, obviously, uh, page, uh, page uh, 43. How do they get? I'm going to ask the questions on the. It looks really bad. Um, there's 6,400. I take it that's. Is, is this averages? Or obviously, so, quick, how do they get those numbers? That's what so, this saying. is assessed against a NOF attribute, and that is a 95th percentile. So, the value. We have 5% of the samples are higher than that number. Yeah, so just, just for some clarity, so there's, there's two types of monitoring programs around this. There's, the, there's what we call representative sampling, which is um, what shown in this table, which is based on a five-year assessment period. And in this particular case, it's looking at, as, as Katie said, you know, uh, the 95th percentile. Um, but in addition to that, the program that we're talking about today is what we call the surveillance program. And so that's where we do the weekly sampling and, and actions taken based on, on a single reading. So there's, you know, depending on what the level are of that single reading, it is um, the level of you know, risk for, for swimming at that point in time. So there's, it is a little confusing because there's different standards that apply depending on whether you're looking at it from a representative point of view or from a surveillance point of view. Is it the, so the question, the, the answer, is it above when it hits over that? We've got the 6,400 because obviously there's many of those 90 samples. There's only, you know, there's only five over 6,400 in, in that. So I'm just trying to understand the community, look at that and look and go, oh, this is the average, not understanding what the 90 percentile is, when the reality is, is it's actually a lot lower on average. Uh, with all the testing that we did. Yes, so the health risk is based on the 95th percentile. That's what the government said we have to assess. Yeah. assess it and can we communicate, though, that those, generally those high, uh, are, are usually in this range. If we push down the group, there's certainly a correlation between those, those numbers. So I'm just trying to just to communicate like the community sees that. When we're looking at numbers to, to, to communicate that this is just an average of on a daily basis of the river. The daily basis, there's actually a lot lower than that. You can average over those five years. And you do have these high spikes, which are they concentrating on the high spikes. But I'm just going by the day. I'm just being Joe Blocks when we're looking at this and trying to understand this. Okay, so the 95th percentile value is aligns with a, um, sorry, the threshold for the D band aligns with if you swim on a, any given day, regardless of flow conditions, you have, I need to double check, but I think a 3% risk of becoming sick. That is how the, the guidelines are set and that is how we can 
Aber das sehen wir bis heute. Ja. It's not very clear. No. It's, it's not very clear. And then, as far as I'm looking, uh, if we're getting uh, government to see these things and going to pay them people, what's really there. And actually, probably 90% of the time, it's not. There are spikes in the system. Um, there's certainly, a, it's good information, but there's certainly indication from me. And the, in these months, I'm just looking forward to Matara. <laughs> the difference in some days is phenomenal. What happens between those, those towns um, where there's no rainfall change or anything like that? But I'm just, need, it needs to be clear. I think I'm just trying to make clear for the community to understand these numbers. I don't know. You don't suggest us. Confusing's not good when we're trying to tell the story. No, it's not absolutely. We're slightly tied with what we're required to report, um, but yet we can work on the, on the comms around and that. Just another quick follow up in regards to fecal contamination. Obviously, that report, I'd love to see that report go around again, the traceability, which we've yeah. done. Um, my reading of it was that Avian has. Made there's a lot of avian and all the samples, they do have an influence on at base levels and and a major portion in base levels too. So from what I can remember reading, I have very clear document. So I, again, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I'm you know, trying to get the communication wrong. Yeah, um, and we've done a summary report around those, which is um, quite useful as well. So yeah, we'll get those reports circulated. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Councillor McDonald. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks to Katie for that. Look, um, we, we can't get this confused. This is not about causation, this is a response. So it's really important. And the communication that Adrian's talking about is, and Neville's talking about, is very important. Community Facebook pages are really well used in communities. Um, also, to people that the dogs down to the rivers on those hot days. And that's something that really activates people as around the pets. So let's keep on that. The other thing, too, is that while we talk about a response, we don't want to overplay it. So we don't want to go like to the forest service where we have been restricted and then prohibited. And so people see the warnings all the time and they get immune to them. We want to be really specific of when we do things and then hit it hard. So good work. Thanks for that. Thanks, Councillor. Good points. Um, Councillor Evans. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, Karen, with regards to science and the rumours, and, and, and there's been a few questions raised here by a few councillors indicating what causes lowering and how like E. coli. It's a, it's a great um, tool that we have in the lower way. There's a lot of discussion on, a lot of negative discussion, but actually, it's a it's a hugely positive discussion with regards to E. coli and the measurement of it and the ability to control flow. So currently on the 9th, 10th and 11th, we had some heightened flow through the lower wire um, and reporting at D as bad. Current lower data is B in the lower wire below uh, to a tapery. Um, and that also, when you look at the information, the water temperature was quite low and lowered slightly while that flow increased through to around 140 cubics as they released 80 cubics and four other tributaries had it in by that stage 140. But since then, the water temperature, as it's dropped off, has increased again considerably up to 19.55 degrees. But it's still sitting at a state of B. We talk about science and I'm, I'm you know, the on Mars and everything else. It's a great idea to use in a lot of other streams where there's no control in the flow. The only control comes from nether events. In that situation, we've got some sort of control over water, the ability to put water in, see what changes happen. It's a great scientific tool. Considering that higher up as it comes through, it's still around D, I feel, and, and, and my greatest fear is the Aralia stream, which comes in. Uh, even though it's a small flow, it's sitting at B, um, which is always an issue. The Aralia stream is an issue that adds so much to imagine how high this would be if 
if the Aurelia wasn't dropping into the OIL, this could be in the top 15 percentile of good rivers. So, you know, my question is, it is a moving target. The question that other councils and councillors have asked regarding flow, and also avian, so everything else, it does show just quite clearly in the last few days, flow. Works. Uh, so um, through you, Ben Jim. So we have done some work around trying to, I guess, uh, understand some of those relationships that you're talking about. Um, and I can see that report that was done on that. Um, and um, so one of the things we had asked ESR to do was actually do you see seasonal patterns? Because we know you do see seasonal patterns in, in the flow. Um, they couldn't actually pick up seasonal patterns in E. coli, which was kind of interesting. But what they did pick up was a very strong link between the amount of rainfall over the last three to five days, depending on which site you're looking at, and the level of E. coli. So there's a, there's a very clear link, I guess, with weather. Um, there was a less clear link with, with flow. Um, but I agree, um, this is this is where we sort of need to get a better handle on some of these relationships in order to have um, more useful um, conversations with, with the community around, you know, what actions to take both in terms of staying safe, recreate, as well as um, improving the quality of our water. Um, all of this uh, needs to be done through plan change to Atahi uh, because you know the government requires us to um, achieve a certain amount of uh, you know quite high level of results around around these um, attributes. So there will definitely be more coming through through that process of our performance. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's just that one river that has such Without seeing that rainfall, it has that ability to go like that with regards to flow quite dramatically. And when you're reading the information, it'll appear to flow on the apparently, you can see that flow has worked. Um, and, and it's not there, it's not, that's the situation we find this. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Rodway, and then we'll finish with the Chair Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, um, three questions, uh, Katie and Karen. Um, cyanobacteria, Peter referred to this before about, about crying wolf. Um, <clears throat> it seems, and you, he mentioned it about not being able to determine whether it's toxic or not. Um, is there is there work going on in that area? Because it would be really good to be able to test for the toxic toxins in the water so that you can tell people yes, it is dangerous or you know, that it's there, but it's not actually um, the problem. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I would have to say yes, but I don't think it's going to be the environmental factors that regulate toxin production are an area of research internationally. Um, the, the toxin production is incredibly variable in space and time. So if you have an algae bloom, you know, you might have a stream bed several metres wide with algae covering it. And within the order of a few centimetres, there may be toxin production happening and not toxin production happening. So from that aspect, it is a really difficult thing to test for. Um, a couple of different elements of testing the toxins in the water versus what's in the mats. So typically you the toxins in the water are much less concentrations than what's held in the mats. Um, and we actually have done some toxin testing on mats this summer, which did find some toxins but not at extremely high levels. Um, the other thing that is emerging in that area is around the question of ra rather than testing for the toxins themselves, should we be doing genetic testing and testing whether the algae that is there has the potential to produce tox toxins rather than is it actually producing toxins? Um, and again, this is all an active area of research. Okay, thanks. Um, the other uh, second question was um, 
the spreadsheet that Jeremy requested from you, Karen, that you sent around, very interesting. And um, <clears throat> it would be really good if you could give us that, those reports you referred, referred to just a wee while ago, because you know, this has been a topic for many years, and people think oh, it's caused by dark it's caused by this and that kind of thing. So the information you've got on that would be really useful for us to all have a look at that. And the last question is um, in relation to the Areti estuary on page um, on page 43, the second table there, you've got the Areti uh, New River Estuary at Maui is poor, B, but New River Estuary at Wilson Club is good. Um, but Wilson Club's upstream of um, Do you have an explanation as to why those two should be different? Yeah, I, I do actually. <laughs> 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 yeah. Chopped, I do. Um, so uh, what we've discovered is that the site at which we have been doing the sampling at Amawi has sort of um, increasingly gotten cut off from, from the main parts of this, just sort of like this, um, uh, you know, like little, like little piece. So it's, it's, not, it's probably not actually being that representative of of the history, so yep. So we're um, doing some some work to, um, to to relook at where we can actually get access at that site. So we're actually sampling the history, not like sort of puddle building, you know, like it's a little cut off. Um, yeah. Not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, Chairman Horrell, thanks. Yes, yeah. Thank you for that report. Um, no, I was a bit like Morris uh, thinking um, a Maui in the Cargo City discharge and would be interested to know about the proximity. But um, yeah, just looking at some of this uh, is, is really interesting that some of it, those high levels, Matau and Gore, and they had thought a Maui, do, do look to, to point towards municipal and um, industry um, factors. We know with E. coli from remnants, will get a spike after rain. So, uh, and I guess the thing we're probably trying to grapple with is with swimming is nobody normally wants to go and swimming when the river's high or it's dirty, but uh, is this um, 95 percentile information giving people a really good scare? We don't be scared because we don't want them to get sick, but normally a few days after afterwards the river clears up, if, if it's from ruminants, it drops away dramatically again. And, and, and I guess the other thing that, uh, we're always told that uh, the Lawa thing, everybody does it the same, but when I talk to some other regional councils, they're not all quite the same. And I guess my question is, are we, are we beating ourselves up to, uh, too much over, uh, uh, over everything being D and some others might be reporting it slightly different? Obviously, we, we want people to know when it's not safe. And um, and we know that the E. coli is, is, is an indicator of pathogens, and you can do more expensive tests to follow up and see what, is it ruminant, is it, where is it from, but the cost is prohibitive, so we normally don't, don't, don't bother. But I guess as a few of us would, would like to get ahead around this a wee bit more. We know for most of that lower data, we want 5, 10, and, and preferably 15-year data to be confident if there's a trend going one way or another. But the swimming weight, when we move from weight ability to swimming ability, it probably raised E. coli considerably higher than in, in, in the health of the river because of that. that. So just, it's probably a bit vague, but I think it's been a good conversation and if we can use this data it to actually make some changes, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sorry. I've got Rachel as well, she's behind you, so yeah, <laughs> UT, as I mentioned earlier, we're just finalising the framework workshops for the year, the rest of the year at the moment, and one of the uh, things we have in the traditional science workshop. So, very happy to bring this topic back to a workshop. Perfect, you've answered my question. Thank you. Um, and, sorry, I was just going to super quickly say in response was um, one is that it's probably worth knowing that the microbiological guidelines are. There's um, a research project underway that we're part of that's kind of reviewing the science that underpins them. So, um, so that is a good, and um, we'll see how, how that works out. Um, and uh, secondly, that at the moment our reporting follows um, what is, is requiring of us, uh, but that, um, I think that there is confusion around this and that um, we're planning to do a bit of a review of this program 
and, and, and part of that will be to look at, at the comms and how, how we can improve that um, as well. So we can do that this year. Brilliant. Thank you, Stuart. You may speak last. Definitely on the other one. What's that? Yeah, sort of wavering between good and bad, is it? So that relates to, so that's um, marine, that relates to guidelines set in 2002 for recreational water quality. We don't have anything more recent for marine, and that is essentially equivalent to a sea band. So it's, it's okay, but it's not great, would be how I would term it. There is some risk. Those sites. Thanks. Okay, folks, we've had a very interesting discussion, um, and my science brain is been working really hard. So, thanks very much, um, staff. That was a really good um, discussion, and thank you, councillors, for your um, obvious um, research and homework um, and insightful questions. Uh, would somebody like to move the report be noted, please? Thank you, Councillor Rodway. Seconded, Councillor Peberton. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Moving swiftly on to item five, the analysis of New Zealand Council's responses to climate change. Uh, just before we start, uh, Rachel, um, I found this a really interesting report and very thorough. And very useful. Uh, and uh, given that we have got our own climate change subcommittee meeting still to come, um, I just, my preference, if you're agreeable, is to hear from the councillors who are not on the climate change subcommittee first, um, so that we can, those of us on that subcommittee, can take that information um, and uh, those thoughts about the report back to the subcommittee meeting that's coming up. If you, if you have a problem with that, then speak now and we'll just go with flow. But um, I'm very keen to hear the thoughts of the councillors who are not on that subcommittee so that the subcommittee is well informed when they look at it later. Is that okay with everybody? Great. So, Rachel, if you lead us off and then we'll, um, we'll perhaps hear from some of the other councillors. Thank you. Yes. So, um, first of all, I couldn't be here today. So, I'm covering this item on. Of the team. I would just note, and probably relates to your previous comment, Chair, that we do have the Climate Change Subcommittee meeting coming up on the 15th. There is also a council workshop that day, so we are exploring whether to allocate some of the time um, during that workshop to this particular report as well, being aware that it's quite a mouth to digest and that you may want to have a more detailed discussion than, you will be possible, than it will be possible to have today during the committee meeting. So, yes, we have the um, climate change report, which assesses the approaches taken um, across the country, putting that into context, not only for us, um, but for the um, other councils. Um, obviously, we, we're working um, with the other councils in partnership with Taumarama, with the interagency group. The first governance level meeting of that group is coming up shortly. That won't necessarily be digging into the, the detail of the report at the first meeting, but we're expecting to get there not too far away. So, um, yeah, that's a resource for, for multiple purposes. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take questions. Um, and, yeah, we, we do have the subcommittee and um, the workshop coming up as well. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, so those, those councillors who aren't um, on the subcommittee, uh, I'd like to take your questions first. Thank you, Councillor Pinkerton. Um, probably in general questions probably more probably easily asked, I suppose. Um, I just noticed in the chart that we were the only council in the South and that had a target for um, emission reductions. Being that we've been working together going forward with the MBA and what's the use is um feel for getting um, traction with the other councils around this. So, through you, Chair, that's very much the live conversation at the, the staff level at the moment with the interagency working group, which has met um, four, four times now. Uh, we are clearly about to meet at a governance level, so certainly though that's the type of conversation we will be all having as part of those meetings that are coming. 
difficult conversations, I think, councillor, coming up. Um, anybody else from not from the subcommittee who'd like a, a question, a comment? I'll let, even let you have a comment. Great. Okay. The floor is open. Thank you, Councillor Cook. I'll just say it took us a wee while to get off the ground with actually doing something practical about climate change. Uh, I think if Councillor Garten had pushed his narrow with a climate emergency now, then you would have got more agreement around the table. It's been happening in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm really encouraged about what this council is doing. I'm even more encouraged that the council is working on a regional basis with other councils to um, deal with aspects of climate change where we might have an influence. So I think we're making progress now. It just took us a wee while to get going. Indeed. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Councillor Rodway. Well, I just reiterate what you said, Madam Chair, about the report. It's very comprehensive and very good. And it really, uh, really uh, sets the scene for us to um, really develop a really good policy here for this council and for the region in terms of um, production of greenhouse gases and creation. So um, really looking forward to the workshops and meetings on this. Thanks, Councillor Morrison. Just a, in addition to that observation, just to, to note that the for the regional uh, effort that's coming up, this report is extremely valuable and it's part of a wider package of information that staff have prepared for that government's level um, engagement with before. So it's really but to acknowledge that there's some really rich resources that are increasingly available to us to guide our conversation. Thank you. Um, Chairman Horrell, maybe. Yes, um, those comments, great work the staff have done, it's quite comprehensive. And some of the discussions I've been having around the countryside, it's fairly obviously the territorials are not up to speed to the same extent as regional councils, probably for obvious reasons. But um, it, it will be good to get that committee up, up and up and running. The other thing will obviously be a conversation um, on that joint committee. But um, Naitahu have done some very good work in the climate space, and it would be be good to have that incorporated in, in there. And 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 they should be a participant, I imagine. It's it's uh, in it anyway. So it's we, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And, and the, they did some really good work, and I was. We've seen it before, but um, there was one or two at the Otago um, and South and Regional Forum were quite surprised and embarrassed they didn't, they weren't, they weren't more of a pay with what's going on. But uh, but it's about, I guess, it's all working together and um, and that regional focus is essential. We, don't, we want some coordination at that level. What we do as a council, that's, if that's different, it's actually walking the walk, but um, identifying on a regional basis what we can actually do it. Thank you. Um, and my final comments on that would be um, that there's a lot here that we don't really have to reinvent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some councils have done some extremely good work around the country, and I'm hoping that we can pick and pick and choose a little bit of, uh, about what might you know what might work for us. Uh, and I guess the other um, the other highlight is the internal work. Um, not just the regional work because that's really important, but as uh, Chairman Horrell says, that walking the walking the talk ourselves and how we um, can work this through into our own strategy and policy as <laughs> um, an essential element, and which which perhaps might answer the question that is sometimes raised about why we don't have a separate um, why the climate change subcommittee is a subcommittee. Um, but, but ultimately, that should just be part of our strategy work, in my opinion, um, and not a separate thing. It's just the way we do things, ultimately. But I look forward to the, the work that's coming, and uh, please pass on our thanks to the report writer, because uh, she's done an excellent job. Uh, so the recommendation is uh, to note the context and key findings, of the report. Note the report will be used to inform discussions on how Environment South and will respond to climate change at the next climate change subcommittee meeting. And note the update regarding the ongoing climate change and community resilience work program and associated progress. All of that.
Thank you, Councillor Rodway. Seconded, Councillor Morrison. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, item six. Six. Seven or nine, but that's fine. Um, strategy, science, and engagement in policy and government reform group work plan, including its external agency report. <laughs> Welcome back, Rachel. <laughs> So this is an um, update by both uh, my group and Lucy's group, which has really shown the key uh, work programs and where things are at. In addition, we try to bring matters of national and regional interest to you. So you will see um, we have really covered all of the matters of national interest in, um, in the previous items with so much um, out for submission at, mo at the moment. In terms of regional, um, there's a, a short update from beyond 2025 Southland, but the team will be coming and talking to you very shortly. Um, they've got sessions of staff and governance planned over the next couple of months. So uh, that's the matters of regional interest and then just the, the group, um, the group's work. Programs and updates. So if there are any questions, we're happy to take those. Questions, councillors? There's a lot going on. Okay, not a question, but there's a lot going on. Yeah. I'm very appreciative that we're getting this in front of us. We're frequently asked, what is the council doing here or doing there? And to actually have this stuff tabled and before us is very valuable. And I'd like us to acknowledge that. All right, so I'd like to move the. Thank you, Councillor Roy. Seconded. That's my file. Yeah. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Next. Thank you. Right, that takes us to uh, extraordinary and urgent business, which there is none of. Uh, and therefore, we will move into public excluded for the remaining items. Which we're about to be given. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll move if we get good reasons. Yeah, well, I'm sure there are good reasons. So we're moving into public excluded as the matter under discussion is before the Environment Court and therefore Council is authorised to deliberate in private. Have to move that, Chief. Councillor Cummings. Seconded, Chief McConnell. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. 